you probably seen me. I, I do this way too much. Um, I am here going live with Nimsy Insights with a special guest today, as usual, Yos Zetche, who is the author of a new book called Characters with Character. And this is, I, I've had the opportunity of being involved with Yos since. Um, since the beginning of the publishing process on this, but I, I don't want to take credit for Certainly not going to take credit for this because it's a lot of love and I did not do very much at all other than just chuck it over the fence um, to the folks at Multilingual Magazine. But this has been a labor of love for Yost for quite some time. And today I wanted to bring him on to, to talk about this uh, Book. But first, let's start off here. Um, we should be leaving st live streaming right now on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all of that stuff. Um, so please, if you have questions for Yoast, if you have comments, um, if you have the book and you love it and you want to say something, leave it down in the comments. Um, we'll try to be checking those later on today um, as we get time. And I don't know how long we're going to be doing this, but we're going to be doing it for a little while. And I think I've bought us enough time now to make sure that all the live streams are are working properly so i'll turn it over to you yo so um, take a minute to introduce yourself sure i i appreciate being being on on this live stream with you tucker and i also appreciate um you guys through your multilingual um arm um approaching me to publish this book and with you and 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 then publishing the book and and taking good care of me and the book in the process. Um, it's like you said, it's been a labor of love. It's I've been working on this actually for about 10 years. Um, you know, it doesn't have, if, um, it's not much text in the book per se, but um, there is a lot of thinking behind the little bit of text you find. And, and you will see that the book really is more of a, um, we call it a table, coffee book. It's a book that you can proudly show your visitors um, um, and use it to explain why you love language so much and why, um, why especially written language. Of course, it's a book about written language, which is not the only kind of language, obviously. Many languages don't even have a writing system. But as we know, Many do, and likely the language that you speak or the languages that you speak and write do have writing systems also. And I have, I love language. I'm a, I'm a, you know, I, the other day I was talking to a group of people and I said, you know what? I think about language. I dream about language and, and that's what I do. I'm, I'm, I'm about language. And, and that's true. I mean, it's, you know, it's not even over exaggerating. There's so many aspects to language that I love and one aspect certainly is the way that <clears throat> that people have been ingenious expressing themselves through writing um, um, and and through developing systems of writing and 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 expressing themselves in written form that are just mind-blowing I think mind-blowing and really beautiful well, and that's kind of what I wanted to show in that book yeah, and you're the one to talk about it. This is not your first book. Um, I, I would have introduced you as the guy who wrote the book on translation, but that would mm -hmm. be inaccurate because you've written so many. I, um, <laughs> you have Characters Without Characters. You have Found in Translation, of course, which you co-wrote co with Nellie Kelly. Translation Matters. That was actually my introduction to you was oh, trans right? translation matters yeah i mm -hmm. it was one of my fir first books that i picked up on my journey to becoming a uh, you such a fanboy and oh. I, I, I was fascinated to, um it's a collection it's more of an anthology though um i don't know why i say though but it, it's very interesting and i was fascinated to understand how you got your start so i'm translating being a bible translator in china and you have a whole different book on that, which is aptly named the the Bible in China, which mm -hmm. we see here. Uh, what else do we got here? Uh, how to succeed as a freelance translator? Well, those are uh, you know those are just books where I wrote a chapter. Um, oh, um, in, well. So so. Um, oh, All right, sorry, <laughs> I don't want to get too excited about those. Things. But um, my my point that I'm trying to make is you're quite the prolific author, and um, 
I consider myself a fan. So oh, it's, thank it's, you, Tucker. It's I good. appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but let's uh, let's talk about uh, characters with characters. It's available online right now. Um, let me just pull it up. It's available on Amazon or all online major retailers. So if you're seeing this and you want to get yourself a copy, go get it. Um, it's super easy. I pulled up the Amazon right here. And thank you to one click. Oh my gosh, I'm not. I'm in incognito mode. I was gonna say this is super easy to sign in, but I'm not gonna show you guys my password. Um, hey, do it, do it. I challenge you, do. It. Show us your password. <laughs> We're on a live stream right now. I'm not gonna type in my Amazon password. I've got my whole history of credit cards going back to when I was 19 in there, probably. So <laughs> let's just um, let's just get to the book. I have a couple. Um, a couple notes that I've been taking here. I wanted to talk about, I'm going to throw you some curveballs. And just so you guys know, this is this is live. This is not pre-rehearsed. This is not scripted. Um, the way that you find out about these things is you subscribe to Nimsy Insights, you follow us, and you get notified when, when we go live. So please make sure to be doing that. Um, so I say that to say that Yos does not know exactly what we're going to be talking about here. I wanted to talk about um, page 98. Let me, let me get to it really quick. Gosh. So. Um, now, now, since you are looking here for a page number, I want to I wanna tell the audience that the book. Um, um, so I say that to say that Yost does not know exactly. Yost, I think you hit the wrong mute button or something there. About... Um, did I hit it wrong? No, you did. Oh, did I? Well, I let, me get, let me get you back here. Um, I can I can hear. Are you watching the live stream on a device? Am I watching the live stream on a device? Because I can hear it. So what button should I be? Are, do you have the live stream open like on a phone or something? I, I can hear it. Oh, you know, I know it's the Instagram stream that I was listening. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> now we're good. Yeah, My fault. My bad. Instagram stream's working. It's the first time I've ever actually gotten verification that the inf Instagram stream's working because I never maybe check it online. So You're welcome. Yes, that was completely scripted. It was completely planned. <laughs> What, what did you have to say, Yos? Oh, what I was going to say is, you know, Taka was saying, you know, on page 89. So the book, um, I, I imagine the book kind of like an art gallery a little bit. And in an art gallery, you might have some pointers which way to go and how you, you know, go through a museum or an art gallery. But not you, know, you can do anything you want in an art gallery, of course. So, so um, the book also is made in a way that you can do anything you want. There's no page numbers. So you just kind of... Um, look through the book and um, if you really want to mark a page you really have to mark it because you can't remember how much page it, page it was and and that, that to me was actually kind of important and took some extra effort to not have page numbers in there but there you won't find any page it's like a you can stroll through the book rather than read through the book from page one to what, whatever the last page might be we don't even know right I I love that. Well, I, I'm sure somebody knows because we had to send it to the printers at one yeah, point. Course, but. <laughs> but I love that because it takes away like the pressure of, you know, you're not reading a book. You're That's having right. an experience. Right? That's right. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's start off here with um, this. Uh, well, since there's no page numbers, I have to describe it for you. This <laughs> Mongolian script here. And mm -hmm. I was reading about the Mongolian script. And one of the interesting things about this book is that it starts with um, a glyph or a character and then it, it goes into the background and gives you just the right amount of background information mm -hmm. on what this and one of my questions was I mean you're talking um, the book talks about you know the the interplay between Mongolian and Chinese, and mm -hmm. you are certain, certainly an expert on Chinese and all, all of that stuff that goes around there. And I don't even have an intelligent question. I just want you to talk a little bit about the effect and the power that language or that script, written script, has in society, in politics, in the world. Mm -hmm. um, it's a good question. Here. That's that's a really good question because um, y you know um, 
especially when it comes to Mongolian. So Mongolian is a language, many languages, and I think we might not be aware of that, but many languages have a number of different writing systems. Um, and especially when languages um, occur or, you know, are spoken in a politically difficult situation um, with different, you know, different global powers taking charge of areas where that language is spoken, that often leads to the language written in a number of systems. So the Mongolian that's spoken in um, what the Chinese would say outer Mongolia, what we say proper Mongolia, <clears throat> um, which now is an independent country, of course, is um, that Mongolian is written with Cyrillic characters. Why? Because it was part of the Soviet Union, of course. So most, most languages that were um, spoken, uh, written, excuse me, in, in the um, realm of the of Soviet Union are um, have one way of writing, of expressing themselves and writing through Cyrillic. And there's nothing wrong with Cyrillic characters per se, of course. I'm, sure, in fact, sure. you are mentioning lots of Cyrillic characters in the book. But um, the traditional way of um, writing Mongolian, of course, is very different. And you see this image here. It's a, it's a language that's written um, not from left to right, which most languages are, many languages are, others from right to left, obviously, but, but this one is written from, from top to bottom. And um, the political interesting thing about this is right now, so this is the kind of writing you find in what the Chinese call Inner Mongolia, so the, the province of Mongolia within China. And, um, and uh, you know, we all know that, that the Chinese have a real drive towards a very unified or <clears throat> um, very cynicized way of nationalism right now. And, and so um, Mongolians in, in, in Mongolia, in China, are really fighting to be able to keep their language alive. When, um, for instance, in, in schools um, where Mongolian was taught, it was, is now replaced with Chinese, and, and the, the, the writing system is not taught anymore, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it's a, it's a political hotspot right now, actually. Kind of interesting that, that you know, writing systems can become a political problem, and this is one of those cases where it is. Here's what I what I really like about the way it is written. You can see um, one one thing I um, mention in most little stories that accompany the characters is that is the technical solutions to 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 print or to to um, digitize the the characters. Um, this is written in Unicode. So Unicode, as you know, is sort of the the, that meta language that allows um, the vast majority of writing systems to be written in one code page. Code pages used to be the the um, the coding behind a writing system that made it impossible to mix different writing systems on one page. So you couldn't have Cyrillic alongside Chinese, alongside alongside Latin um, characters. Um, Unicode solved that, and Unicode now is able to to you know, to write the vast majority of writing systems and accordingly um, vast majority of, of, um, of characters. And I love the way that um, font developers develop their fonts, um, which are, you know, possible to be, to be um, printed through Unicode in ways that um, the, those, those characters traditionally are written. So if you look at, at those characters there, you can see this um, is written in the style that, um, that uh, Mongolian was written. So Chinese, as you know, was traditionally written with a brush, right? You see these, these really soft lines in a, in, a, in, a, um, in a Chinese character. Mongolian was written with reed. So, um, you know, rather than the soft brush you can see expressed here in this character, you see sort of the edgy nature of um, this, these characters written with, um, with reed that, that, you know, are dunked in, um, in, in, in ink and then, you know, used to, to write these characters. Um, I love that because to me, this is one of those really fortunate 
encounters of of culture, art, and technology, and and all done really well, and all culminating in this well, in in this in the, these beautiful characters. Culture, art, and technology, and technology that has evolved over time, right? Yeah, um, because. Much. A reed is a form of technology, if you think oh, about it in a macro human evolution sense. And it's oh, fascinating to me that there's, you know, I, I don't know Unicode as much as I should, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not even going to try to talk about Unicode, but it's fascinating to me that someone out there has taken the effort to program all of this to preserve not just the like what it looks like but what it feels like so mm. to, to capture the essence um down yeah, to the no, point you're right. where, like sharper corners because we use a reed on this mm -hmm. instead of instead of a paintbrush yeah so so i got to choose the pick one um or i got to mm -hmm. pick the first one I, let's go this is one that yost picked right before we went live here um i don't know if you can see here we go <laughs> talk to and i don't even i need to go up here to even speak intelligently about this this is uh, i'm not going to speak i'm not even going to try to speak intelligently go for it yes. <laughs> tell us about this <laughs> so let me let me find it my, so i do have the yeah. book here um, it's on page book. number blank <laughs> on page number blank you find i i put a little little um a little bookmark in it so you can and i can find it better and you this, know that um, works that works by the way because if i'm uh, if i'm opening up i don't have the book yet but if i'm opening up this pdf and i'm looking for something that i thought i wanted to find i end up seeing seven more things that i didn't even know that see? i wanted to find so <laughs> it works so, so this is this is a, a, also a fun character and also a fun story about Unicode. I think so. This character, to my knowledge, has been used just once. Crazy, right? You have a character. I mean, think about. I mean, the characters that we're using letters in, in the Latin alphabet, or if you are, well, you know, Russian or Ukrainian, maybe in the Cyrillic alphabet, up your Chinese in the in the in the you know in in the Chinese writing system, um, are used again and again and again millions and millions and millions of times this character has been used once and um and um it's called the multi-ocular o um it's cyrillic and it's it was used um in a um in a um, i'm not sure whether it was a translation of a psalm or a comment to a psalm um, where it talked about multi-eyed seraphim. Seraphim are one of the the classes of angels in in, Bible, in the Bible, and um, there is there's actually not a real reference to multi-eyed seraphim in the Bible, but apparently in in um, in, in author, Russian Orthodox. Um, um, uh, you know, theology, there are so, those things. And, and that's when that character was developed and used. And you can clearly see this is very multi-eyed, right? I mean, there's lots of little eyes well, in like there. Straight from the book of Revelations, right? It, it kind <laughs> of, maybe it was, who knows? Don't, and, don't get and, me started uh, on Bible trivia and history and culture, because that is something I can and probably shouldn't talk about. <laughs> but it's fascinating to see how a lot of this goes back to, like, the original stories, so to speak. Oh. Oh, absolutely. And of course, you know, now that we are talking about the Bible, oh boy, the history of writing wouldn't be without the history of the Bible, right? So many of the writing systems mm -hmm. that we are talking about in the book are really closely intertwined with the, the history of Bible translation. But that's a whole nother, nother thing. So here's what I wanted to say about this. So it's, it's, a, it's, kind of a, it's kind of like an, you know, an Uber emoji, you know, I mean, this is like if you ever wanted to come with an, with an emoji, this is an emoji. It was used sometime in the in the you know in the six hundreds, I think. You know that that um, somebody came up with that, and the Unicode developers actually sat down and developed a place for it in its in in the alphabet. It was used once. And yet, <laughs> they developed they developed coding for this character, which I think is crazy. Of course, there's very few fonts who are able to to um, to to um, to depict that character, but but um, there are some fonts, and this is one of them. I think it's just a you know it's a quirky story, but again, it's a story where um, you know technology honors culture as quirky and as rare and as 
as um, you know obscure it might be, but somebody in on on the Unicode team um, took that serious enough to develop a, the the coding for it, and 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 here it is, and it's beautiful, and you know anyone who looks at it and is told what it is, multi eyes goes like, well, well, of course it's multi eyes. That's that's what's looking at me. Here. <laughs> right, right. That's let's. Funny. Let's, uh, I, I think we have some people down here in the chat. Oh my goodness, I can't read this though, it's too small. Um, let's see, let's see who's talking in the chat. Give us some shout outs. El Criollo, sorry, my Spanish. El Criollo Viajero. Welcome. Using some emojis. If you're in the chat, say hi, guys. Give us, give us a, give us a what's up. Give us a smiley face. Give us a something. <laughs> um, we love to see you. We love to have you, Rodrigo. Good to have you, sir. Thank you for joining. Um, anybody else? If you have questions, um, come drop them in the chat with us. Now I'm going to uh, put Yost on the spot here because yeah. I was reading about and here. Let me just let me just go to it here. Let me get back to my screen, and we're gonna go to. Right here, Firefly. I saw this <laughs> because my my American brain obviously sees the the English, um, and so I stopped and I read about it. And that's how you're supposed to consume this book is yeah, you're, you're supposed right, yeah. to catch something. And oh, I want to read more about this. And right. here, I'm just gonna read it for you guys. It says you can't um you can't create or display the Japanese proportional font from the previous page without an advanced image or desktop editor. But if you want to do something less exotic while well, at the same time, so just so you know, the previous page is talking about a different glyph, but I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole yet. Um, but if you want to do something less exotic while well, at the same time inspiring your niece or granddaughter, take a look at Gabriola, a free-flowing open type font. This font allows you to change the ligature, dis ligature displays. Compare the first two examples with their use of FL and FI, and even to choose different stylistic sets. And all this is in a basic tool like Microsoft Word via its font dialog. So talk to me a little bit about this. And then what I want to do to put you on the spot is I actually have, I'll have to bring it up on screen, a uh, open Word doc with Gabriola font installed. And I want you to show me how to use these ligatures because this mm -hmm. is super cool and I don't know how to do it. So yeah. So, so um, it's kind of a, you know, not a very exotic story, but, but that's, that's particularly because I chose it. Um, so, uh, um, you know, the, the previous story in, in Characters with Characters was um, about ways that you, that um, Adobe had developed a proportional font that was able to, um, to display differences in, or to display characters differently, Japanese characters differently, whether they um, were um, when when they were um, displayed vertically or hor horizontally, which is really beautiful and 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 interesting. And then I thought, you know, how too bad that we don't have anything like that in in with the Latin alphabet. And then I encountered this little feature in, like you said, Microsoft Word, and you can actually um in if you go to the microsoft um font di the, the font dialog in microsoft word you go there no. i'm already on the advanced tab you can tell i was trying to do this without your help excellent so i i can't let me let me see whether i can enlarge your view sorry so can... this is the resolution's bad um it's okay. ligatures number spacing number form stylistic sets and i got uh, so you have to go to the stylistic sets, I believe, and there is like a number of. Oh, I see that. Okay. Do you see that? No, it changes the dialogue. Here, let me decrease the font size to like twelve, because then I can see it in the preview dialogue here. Um, Eighteen. Okay, and stylistic sets two, four. Oh wow! So you guys might not be able to see this because. Um, this is Microsoft Word. Can I zoom in? No, it's just a high resolution right, monitor. Yeah. Um, but this is super fascinating. If you go... It's kind of fun. I mean, it's, you know, like I said, if you have a granddaughter or a niece or a daughter who is still in that age that would like to see how, you know, how a beautiful word like Firefly or like, 
um, mermaid or anything like that becomes um, different according to um, what kind of stylistic set you put on it, you will most certainly delight them. So, so um, it's kind of a fun, fun thing to do. Um, and fun to see that we can do it with regular languages like um, Latin based and, and Cyrillic based um, alphabets also. Yeah, this is this is really cool and super easy. So for those of you following along at home, this is some practical advice from this book is and I'm sure this is going to lead to many, many lost hours on my part because this is yeah, exactly. just, oh, Jesus. Now, you do have to there's only very few fonts that allow for that. So you have to have an open type font. Um and um and the, the font that comes with um with Windows um is Gabriola. That's the one that you want to use that. And I don't know what the Mac equivalent would be there. I, I, I'm not a Mac guy. But if you are using a PC, then Gabriola is the font you want to play with and come to these fancy ways of, of writing one word within one font in different, in different stylistic sets. Perfect. All right, let's get back to it. Um, we looked at the, the Seraphim eye. The monster eye. Um, what else? What else do we have? What? Which other one here would you want to go over? So why don't you look at? There's a couple of. Um, there is, for instance, one from um, um, the Feist. This one from the Feistos disc, um, like which you, I love that one. I th let me tell you why I. You tell me. Well, you go ahead and you tell me why you like that one. Oh, you're gonna tell you. You're gonna put me on the spot. I like it just because it looks cool. That that's the it, level of my analysis. I'm, all right. I'm well, just gonna be real here. Like I, I'm not. Um, I, I I am not going <laughs> to hold my own in an intellectual conversation about glyphs with Yosteche. I I'm like it because sure it looks cool. <laughs> well, my intellectuality is to say this looks like from the punk scene in 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 London in the 1970s. <laughs> that's um, but of course like it's not. Art, right? It, <laughs> it looks, totally does. It looks like I, that's. Uh, is that what you wanted me to say? Because that's what I was thinking. It looks like exactly. That's what I hope you would say. <laughs> no, I, 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 I. That's exactly. What, so there's a couple of reasons why I like this. A, it's one of those scripts that have not has not been deciphered. There's a number of scripts um, that just have, you know, that are lost now. Nobody obviously knows how to write them or decipher them, and researchers also have not been able to decipher them and that's one of them on on those on those discs um and um and there's obviously very few samples of it so you can't build a large corpus and then do some kind of an artificially artificial intelligence based analysis of what the meaning might be um so we don't know what that means but you can clearly see you see that those three characters on top of those of the front and the back of those um those discs um, are actually from that disc and are written, yes, in Unicode. Um, so, of course, also coded within within the large collection of Unicode. And um, and you can see that these glyphs are, true. I mean, so the guy in the middle, if he's not a punk, I don't know what a punk looks like. I mean, that's a punk, right? That's that's a punk from the, from the uh, you know, UK in the 70s or, you know, oh, wherever. Hunk. Or like, I, I know this is black and white, but that guy definitely has pink hair. Or he green. has big hair. <laughs> no, I said he has pink, big pink hair. or green or something. Oh, I know right. it's black and white, but when I see this black and oh, white, I, I, see, what I see green hair. <laughs> that's right. I, so I, see, I, I see Justin Peach, my college roommate. Shout out to Justin. What's up, Peaches? Um, yeah, he played in like a, a punk rock. It, it wasn't punk rock. He'd yell at me for saying punk rock. It's some obscure thing. But yeah, that's what I see when I see this. And it's how old? That you know, and this this thing is like from from the you know from fifteen hundred BC, right? Um, so so you you go like so if they in fifteen hundred BC had this way of whatever they tried to write and used used an imagery that is so close to what we have today or what we had just a couple of decades ago, and of course the current punks would say no 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 this is very current this is how it still looks today. Um, I, I, you know, it, it's it's 
again, quirky, but I, I, I love it. And I also love the fact that it hasn't been deciphered. Of course, it would be super fun to be the one who deciphers that script at some point, but it's just fine by me that it's not being deciphered. And it's one of those mysteries that, you know, obviously writing is about expressing yourself, but it's just fine if you, you know, if some people in the past have expressed themselves and, and now nobody knows what they said, but what they have at least left is some kind of a beautiful imagery, artistic um, way of, of seeing themselves and the world. And I, I think that's beautiful and, and to be celebrated. I, I agree. I, I, I'm a big fan of having mystery in language. And mm -hmm. mystery, I think, breeds beauty or the perception oh. of beauty. Because, you know, I'm a... So, you know, my background is not like I was the son of an ambassador and grew up speaking seven languages. Like, I started learning language later in life. And, um, yeah, so I'm not like a super, super, super linguist, right? But I know enough German. I know enough Spanish. I know less, but I know enough French to, like, kind of understand things. And it's hard because by trying to understand things, I miss the beauty, if that makes sense. Like, I, I'm too busy when I'm listening. I'm talking more about spoken language now, but when I'm Yeah, talking, I know, I know. You know, it's, I can't just let the music play, right? I am trying to analyze it, trying to heart it, which is, you know, there's a different kind of beauty to be found in that, for sure. But, oh, there um, is. You know, I was just, we, my, my wife and I just finished a, um, an, an Israeli um, TV show on, on Netflix called Fauda. Fauda? I, I think my wife is watching that. It's, yeah, it's, it's pretty, like it's pretty Israeli intense. Israeli soap it's, opera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, so and that show is entirely in, in, um, Israel, in, in Hebrew and Arabic. And, um, and we loved it. Obviously, we use subtitles because we neither speak Hebrew nor Arabic. But it was so beautiful, we thought. You know, I mean, it's not a beautiful show by any means. It's a very intense and very violent show. But um, it's a, we, we just sat there through the three seasons. And um, my, my wife is sort of with me on also loving languages. And we just, we just adored listening to those languages that are both very beautiful and, and both very closely related, of course. And, um, and listening to language that we don't understand but we were able to decipher because of subtitles of course uh, you know they of course it's great to know all kinds of languages it's also great to to revel in 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 the beauty of language as it is just expressed without knowing it i mean i was just i was talking to an artist last night we visited some people you know now that we are all vaccinated we can visit some people again sometimes <clears throat> so i've visit, visited with an artist with an artist who does abstract work and um and we talked about you know abstract art is not always to be understood it's just to be experienced you know there is yes you can understand did the artist understand it the same way probably not maybe maybe not um and and i think it's kind of the same with language you know you sometimes you can just let it happen to you and it's got beauty and that's true for spoken language as much as this for written language, I think. I mean, that's, you know, many of the languages that I'm mentioning in the book is, um, are languages that um, clearly I don't know, you know? I mean, the, you know, we just talked about a language that nobody knows and, and there's, you know, the majority of languages that I'm mentioning, I, I don't know, but I can still marvel at their beauty. I can marvel at the beauty of their calligraphy or the way that technology is able to express the, the beauty of that language or that um you know so humans humans are limited in many ways but humans are also full of genius to want to express themselves i think and and one if a society has got, come to the conclusion that writing is an important way of expressing itself many have not and that's just fine they have other ways of truly expressing themselves beautifully yeah. through oral culture um but if you if you have come to a point where you where you um collectively decide or where there is a you know something happening a dynamic happening that somebody comes up with the writing system and you you kind of go along with it um then uh, you know 
the genius, the human genius often takes hold and comes up with systems that are weird and beautiful and crazy. And that's what we are doing in this book, celebrating that. <laughs> that's funny. They already draw better than me back then. Yeah, that's probably true. Hatufim. Okay, I'm going to check out Hatufim. <laughs> and, you know, if you, um, I don't know whether you read the little introduction that I, that I wrote for the book, um, Tucker, but, but um, I, I did, did want to make, make a point in the, in the, in the introduction, introduction that, that um, you know, language, of course, primarily is spoken. That's, that's what language is, is right? And, and then, then it finds different ways of expressing itself in different mediums. Um, and, um, and writing language is a secondary medium. I mean, it is not the primary medium that language expresses itself. Language right. didn't start in writing. Language started in, in, in being spoken, right? So by celebrating writing systems, I want to make really sure that, um, you know, I don't, um, <clears throat> I don't look down upon languages that are not... Um, uh, written. I, in fact, I, I, I find it absolutely mind blowing right. that, that, um, you know, these, that oral cultures have developed such sophisticated, have sophisticated, have developed sophisticated enough ways to survive and to, to, to keep their stories, to, to, um, you know, have their traditions without writing, which is a remarkable thing, right? I mean, maybe we're not smart enough to do it and that's why we need writing right. systems. Um, so I think that's a really important sort of asterisk. You know, celebrating writing systems is great, and that's what I'm doing in this book. But keeping in mind that um, cultures can do very well and can be very rich without a writing system is also important. And and that's what I felt I needed to say in my little introduction. And uh, I hesitate to ask this or not because it, it might be a long a long conversation but what effect does that have when it, when a society develops a writing system what effect does that have on their language spoken and of course written now moving forward like does it make it does it accelerate the evolution i want to be careful because i don't want to you know be making judgment calls about different languages mm -hmm. but does it accelerate does the language does the spoken language then become more complex with the introduction of a written script or does it perhaps dilute that language because now that language the richness of that language has to fit into a written form i i think you can make either case um I, i'm not sure that it i think I'm, I'm not sure that in any case the 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 oral language would um, be enriched by written language. But yeah. I think one aspect that you didn't mention, and that's really important, I think, is that um, typically, as we all know, many languages with lesser diffusion are under a lot of pressure today, right? So mm -hmm. typically, languages that are not written um, are in a context, or the, the cultures are in a context where there are um, majority languages that that typically put a lot of pressure on those languages, and the pressure can be, you know, coming in a number of ways. Can be coming because, um, you know, young people. It's always about young people. Young people make a language so thrive or not. Um, if young people don't see any any future speaking their indigenous language. Um, and rather learning, you know, Russian or Spanish or Chinese or whatever um, dominant language might be the one in their context, then um, that language, um, you know, is under, well, under threat logically, right? I mean, if only elderly people speak that language, those will die at some point, and um, with that, the language will die. Now, what a writing system can do, and I think that's a really important point to make, is it can give... Um, a language is a much better chance for survival. And I think that's really, um, that's, a, that's a, you know, relevant point at this time when, you know, we've all heard those numbers that, that on average every two weeks a language dies right now. Of course, that's, you know, that's 
seen over the course of a whole century. But languages die all the time. You know, the last speaker of a language um, language dies regularly, and and you know, COVID had its big unfortunate impact on that also. You know, being being more threatening to um, you know elderly people, and and of course, elderly people of of um, threatened languages as well. <clears throat> so. Writing systems have an important place, and and if there is, however that drive comes about, um, a drive to develop a writing system with the um, hope to um, preserve a language or to give, for instance, young people a, a way to express themselves in writing. You know, young people do express themselves in writing through texting, through you know, however they 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 express themselves then that can be a really positive thing. Does it have a um, limiting impact on, on the language? I think it can, but you know, it can also help the language to flourish. So it's a, you know, there is no easy answer to that, I think, for sure. Um, and, um, but um, it's, um, make sure this, yeah. Um, but, uh, you yeah, know, it's, it's, a, it's a complex question, let's put it like that. Oh. I'm on mute. I'm sorry. Uh, you're um, on mute. I, I've been listening. We've all been listening this whole time. I've just been trying to figure out how I can um, get a copy of this before this stream ends to do. And if you guys are watching this um, stream, uh, either live, if you're live, this will this will be living on um, on the interwebs for quite a while now. So if you're watching this, then. Um, Follow my directions here. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to go to Amazon right here. I've logged in non-incognito. And if you're anything like me, you spend way too much money on Amazon. There's, God, he's going to ask me for my password again. All right. Well, it's not. I guess it's not that easy to buy, but it is if you got your your shit together, unlike me. And well, I think I think we all know what your password is anyway. Uh, it's got to be Fat I mean, Mother Tucker, right? Fat I mean, Mother I think Tucker. Yeah, six. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta throw some digits and some some, some numbers in there just to to make the the gods happy, the the algorithm gods. Well, before we close it up here, I would be remiss if if we didn't plug all of the other non book related stuff that you're doing. Talk to me a little bit about the the toolbox journal. This is something that you know I, I was talking to someone the other day and I was like, yeah, you subscribe to Yoast's um, newsletter right and i said yeah i do and then i remembered and i was like you know i haven't gotten it for a while and i think i was subscribed with my old email address so i need to go maybe you should change that i think i will i'm not going to yeah. try to do it live because my success record today is really bad <laughs> it's <laughs> not good <laughs> but tell me about it because back when i used to get it like this this is just a it, it's a solid it's a solid newsletter. It's everything that I would expect in a newsletter. It's not salesy. It's just here's information, and it's just on point, you know, um, on point. Um, doesn't you. waste your time. Doesn't – no fluff. Um, but I'm going to let you talk a little bit about it. Well, so the, the newsletter, um, you know, I've been I've been writing this for almost twenty years now. So it's a it's got a you know I think I'm on edition three hundred whatever fifty or I don't know lots of I've sent lots lots of newsletter out, newsletters out and and it's a um, so <clears throat> I personally am not very technical and truly am not I you know my degree is in in the his is in in Chinese language, and I wrote a dissertation on the history of Chinese Bible translation. I, you know, have never studied code. I have never studied engineering or anything like that. Um, so I'm not super technical, but I'm super interested in making technology work for me, and especially in my professional life. And. Um, and so what um, I um, am doing in the newsletter is I'm talking about how I make technology be my friend, um, not being technical myself. You know, translators and translation professionals have had l this reputation for a long time that they're not very technical, you know. And, and I, you know, some 
that, that's partly true. I think some, in fact, celebrated it for a long time um, that they were not technical. But um, that obviously has to change and has changed also. But it, there is a continuous uh, need to change that because technology is changing right now. There is a lot of push for machine translation. What does it mean for translators to have to work or do we have to work with transla machine translation? And if so, how and, you know, and so on and so forth. And th those are the things that I'm discussing in the newsletter. And I'm... Um, um, uh, like you say, I, I am trying to do it without much fluff. Um, um, you know, I do have really terrible jokes in it, and and um, that's the only kind of fluff that I have. <clears throat> but uh, those um, are the best kind of jokes. Those are the best kind of jokes, exactly. Um, we're, we're both by the way, we, we we know the dad joke. We're no stranger to the dad joke. <laughs> oh, I you know you know the best the, the very best dad joke of all. Uh. Are, so you're going to tell so us. What, what, why, why do they call it hemorrhoids? I don't know. I don't because want to. asteroids was taken. <laughs> that's not wow. bad, huh? I need... And that's on a live stream. Can you believe it? Anyway. Um, oh, yay! I've, got a, I've gotten a button for that. You were in the dead <clears throat> joke of the week contest. <laughs> So anyway, um, my newsletter is um, is fairly long. It's not, you know, um, it's like five, six, seven pages long. If you would, you know, if you put it on on regular eight and a half by eleven paper, and but it's um, I've got lots of interviews with you know interesting people in the industry, and fortunately, I've do, been doing it long enough that I know all the developers of the technology that's relevant to translators, and they're usually eager to talk to me. And and so I talk to them and get uh, insights from them, I think, that are not easily to be had elsewhere, and um, and can t talk to them about what their future plans are, et cetera, et cetera. That's what the newsletter is about. And it's free. That's good, and, right? And it's free. I like free. Free, yep. free is always good. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's um, so you guys, if you're listening out there, you've got marching orders uh it's time to go out and time to get a copy of yo's book and i will be doing it as soon as you guys can't see my password <laughs> anymore on this live stream um i have a copy waiting for me it's just in sandpoint idaho right now and it's um I'm impatient. I'm going to order a new one. So your marching orders. Go out and get a copy of this book. Hell, go get five. This is a great gift. Like, I think you know somebody who in your life is a language nerd who is someone like me when I was 18 and was just fascinated by languages. And I still am, right? Um, but I got a copy. Don't buy one for me. Buy one for the language nerd in your life, the language. Geek. Well, and and let me let me add something to that, Tucker. I, I you know I think that the one that you really should be taken into consideration um, are your clients and are your are the people that you work with. Um, yes. So one way then when we when Tucker and you and you and I started to talk about this book, one way that we saw a real use yeah. case for this book is for whether you are a you know a freelance translator who's working with so many you know clients that you that you translate for or whether you are a language service provider who is um trying to gain new clients or to sol solidify existing client relationships this is really a fantastic book to give away to clients you know whether as a christmas yeah. present or just as a present period and, and I what there's we, customization options too isn't that um, so? So th this is that that that's so exciting, right? You can put your own preface in there. You can put your yep. own logo in there. You you can do with the book. You can brand the book according to what um, you want, and you can, of course, then you don't order it at Amazon. You order it at Multilingual, right? But um, you know they're they're willing to help you um, do all that, and there's you know discounts for bulk orders, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I, you know that that is what excites me also to. So I if I, if I was a marketing center. manager at a large LSP, like you and I have talked about this before. Like this yeah. is this is a home run. We didn't get it out in time for Christmas. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> that's that's our fault. But um this would make a great just if I was a marketing manager at a large LSP, you know, we localize them or obvious or RWS or SEL, somebody like that, I would um this would be the top of my list because it's a ready made um beautiful book like i think every lsp in the industry should have a copy of this on their coffee table 
Um, yeah. If, if no, I walk I into an LSP office and I don't see, you know, of course, I want my copy of my multilingual on, <laughs> on your office, on your coffee table, but a copy of this book. Too. And this. And, and what, what is that? I can't see it. Well, that's and the book. Character. That's the one that I want. That's the one that I want, <laughs> right? So go out there and get it. That's, that's enough from us, though, on, on this um, um what is this? I feel like we're doing one of those PBS donation drives. Like hey, order now, order bulk I'd orders. I'd be good available. at that. Yeah, <laughs> but I think but, I think I could not have told that 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 hemorrhoid joke on on PBS. What do you think? Pro- probably not. Probably not. <laughs> but um, any closing words? I think we're at the top of the hour here, and I know these things don't have much of a schedule. But uh, well, uh, let's wrap I, it up. You know, hey. I think we should celebrate the industry you're working in. That's that's um, you know we sometimes take so much for granted. I think um, we are getting so you we are so used to um, you know to the things that we are we are doing day in day out, doing translation, working with languages. Languages are beautiful, and let's celebrate the fact how beautiful languages are. And um, you know whether this is related to my book or not doesn't matter. Languages are beautiful. Let's celebrate that. Here, here. Well, um, let's play us out here. Um, thank you, thank you, everybody who was able to join today. Thank you very much, Yost, for Thanks, agreeing to do this last minute. As with all of our guests, um, the book is available all, all major outlets online. Um, it is available for bulk order through Multilingual Media. Contact the folks over at Multilingual Magazine to to get that copy. This stream, of course, today is made possible by Nimsy Insights. We don't announce these pop-up events, so subscribe. Make sure that you're getting all of the latest information. And lastly, if you're not aware of Nimsy, if you don't know what we do, we do market research and consulting specialized in, but not necessarily only about the language services industry. We help companies go global um, and do whatever that takes, whether it's technology consulting, market research, user experience research, in-country focus groups, you name it, lots of services. Talk to us, info at nimsy.com, if you would like to hear more information. And with that, we'll see you next time, guys. Thank you very much, Yost. Thank you. Appreciate it. Y'all have a great day. You too. Bye-bye.